When I started to do this research, there was really almost no concept of infant mental health. If you think about Freud or James or even uh, Watson, uh, the idea that infants had any kind of mental life or emotional processes was something that was completely foreign to us. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. In a recent study that we're proposing, um, we're going to be looking, in fact, at epigenetic effects on development. Those effects are uh, a really direct interaction of the environment with genetic mechanisms. And in this study, we're going to be looking at infants who experience intrauterine growth retardation or stress during, their, uh, during the gestational period and how the effects of epigenetic changes, these early stressors, affect the way they now as individuals, as newborns, as three and four month olds, cope with stress. If they already come into the world biased with a particular way of reacting, these ways of reacting may already create problems for them in their future development. One of the programs I was able to develop here was a program in infant parent mental health. And the goal of that program is to train clinicians uh, from multiple disciplines, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychiatry, pediatrics, psychologists, nurses, while at the same time maintaining my really long-standing and very, very deep commitment to the most advanced research that we know. One of the payoffs for me is that by working with these people, I bring their clinical insights back into the research that I do 
uh, so that it becomes more informed. And I can see this interplay over time. A number of uh, developments that are taking place w within my department, but also across the university that I think are really critical uh, for not only building, building programs at the university, but also for deepening our knowledge. In the psychology department, the clinical program itself is a very research-oriented department, and we have many, many accomplished uh, researchers there. There's a lot of work going on around spectrum disorders, early social-emotional development, and complementary to that, we're developing a new uh, PhD program in uh, brain and development, because it unites with the clinical interests around children. At the same time, at the, at the level of the university, we're developing the uh, a developmental sciences initiative, which is bringing together biology, people in computer sciences, the psychologists, people in nursing, all around issues of development. And those issues go from some of the molecular and genetic work that's going on in the biology department to some of the more community-oriented work going on in nursing and some of the other programs. NIH refers to this as translational, but I see it as a much bigger effort because it recognizes the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with, it recognizes the different levels of programs that we need to be working with. And it also requires a, a, a real change in attitude about limiting the sort of silo nature that has been very productive in research to bring together people who really talk across disciplines, generate what I think of as sort of a kind of messiness in our thinking that would allow for a creation of something um, really new in terms of our understanding how to make progress. One of the reasons I, I think it's important to uh, invest in a, in a place like UMass Boston, it's the idea of vertical research teams. A team headed by a faculty member with postdocs and graduate students and undergraduates. It also gives the undergraduate students a vision of what's possible. But the students here are first generation, many first generation going to school, many of them are children of immigrant families. We can create systems here that help to give them a sense of really what is possible. U UMass, when I first came, I thought was related to the community and what I've come to understand is that UMass is the community. And that from the chancellor's office to, I guess, to the students and their programs, everyone is committed to making that kind of difference.